All right, so today we're going to talk about equity splits. Um, I've talked about startups a handful of times on this channel already, and uh, it's something where I feel like I have a pretty good system for it. Um, and I'll just sort of start out by saying that the main thing, the main objective that I have for anybody uh, when it comes to equity splits is to just offer the utmost flexibility while maintaining contributing your assets to the business. Um, you want to maximize the amount that you're contributing your own assets, time, effort, uh, genuinely, um, so that you're not having any kind of like uh, hidden ambition. And at the same time, you want to have a structure that allows you the the comfort uh, in order to proceed. So I'll sort of discuss in this video as well what advice is out there. Uh, and we'll kind of circle back to to my own take on it and how I think that you should proceed and you know how some of the advice that's out there is kind of uh, it works as an introductory but when it comes to the actual nitty-gritty I, I find the reality to be a bit different but then again some people live in different realities than I do so you might find their advice to be more appealing but I'll discuss when you would take their advice as well but before we begin maybe we should talk about my nose so two weeks ago I had <laughs> A surfing accident which in the gamut of all of the different you know extreme sport style things that I do whether it's mountain biking off of ledges snowboarding through trees or just surfing in greater than overhead sized waves you know I was very fortunate to have gotten off this easy um, wound up with a surgery uh, the, the surfboard uh, essentially cracked me right in the nose so I feel very lucky very blessed um, you know but it's just something that has obviously wound me up with the bandage and caused me uh, to take a significant pause from shooting recording videos and obviously my background today is a little different from my palapa I have moved closer to the hospital so I can recover and also have been nearby in that, that meantime but let's let's get into co-founder equities so I think to start you know we can look at Paul Graham who is the you know original president of Y Combinator and without reading his full blog post um, you know, I'm pretty sure that Paul Graham has long, you know, for a long time been the proponent of suggesting that co-founder splits are equal. And so in other words, every person, you know, your equity is just a uh, hundred divided by the number of co-founders that you bring. And you're welcome to read this and see what he says in the details. Um, but, you know, my understanding of why he makes that argument is because he's seen too many instances where co-founders quibble over, you know, who gets what, and it becomes too distracting. Whereas his fund's objective is to build billion dollar businesses and, you know, the usual uh, round raises would be like, let's say you and your, your let's say one other co-founder are holding, you know, 90% or more, maybe 90 to 95% equity. Uh, and then Y Combinator is gonna take a 5% stake or thereabouts in your business. And then by the time you get your C or your series A, they're gonna take another 10 to 30%. So now you and your co-founder are left with maybe let's say 60%. And then each of you individually with 30%. And then by the time that you get your series B or C, you're going to get diluted again down to maybe like 10%. And so his argument is that, you know, it doesn't really matter at the point that your shares are worth 50 million, whether you're worth 50 million or 100 million. You're still, you know, you now have gone from zero dollars to, you know, lifelong riches. And he would rather see, you know, the the skills and the talents of the co-founder get out of the way as quickly as possible in order to build the business. Um, but I think that there's also something that underlies that type of thinking that's very disarming to the founder. And the reason that I don't like this advice is that, and it would echo as well when I had, uh, you know, conferred with an attorney, a corporate attorney for my own formations, um, you know, you put together uh, anytime you do the, the equity splits, you know, formation documents, and he was strongly pressuring me into a C Corp formation, um, which is more suitable for investment or is the only really uh, structure you use for investment in the US. And effectively, you know, he, along with Paul Graham, along with a lot of the traditional venture capitalist or investment track advice, you know, really advise or advocate a 
a take or a view on equity and, and, and frankly what that means as well as returns to any founder so any actual person taking the risk um, you know they really seem to advocate a, a set of attitudes that leave a founder vulnerable to the legalese the legal experts the financial experts and the people that play in these sort of these games of detail whether that's detail with the account books detail with the legal terms um, and so, you know, one of the best things that you can do or one of the best books that I had read, which I did not have pulled up here, is called uh, Venture Capital, Venture Deals. It's called, I believe, Venture Deals. Let's give. Uh... So this is a book by Brad Feld. Um, this is uh, Brad Feld is uh, the founder of Techstars. So, you know, maybe you'd even put him on the level of like a Paul Graham. I believe uh I, mean, I don't really equate someone's credibility with their net worth, um, but the, the book is great. Um, there's a lot of good uh, insights into the different terms that you would find in a term sheet. So what is a term sheet? It's basically just a contract that says you're going to get X, Y, Z amount of money from an investor. Um, and there's very different, you know, ways that those deals get structured. So whether that's like at a future round, the investor is going to have initial preference to buy into that round. So meaning that they're, you know, they have a ability to, you know, invest as the lead investor in your, your series A round when you go from seed to series A, for instance. Um, it can be liquidation preference so that if you have to dissolve the company, you know, they get paid back first and, you know, you're going to wind up with zero as the founder. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a great book to go and just self-educate on. Um, but I think even in terms of the scope of this video, I, I don't really focus too much uh, on that. Uh, I focus more on the early formation stages when you're even pre-investment and you're just meeting co-founders because that's where I think I have the most experience. Um, and I think that, you know, if we go back into some of the, the Internet advice, you know, this is a more up to date, you know, Michael Siebel, uh, you know, newer president, but no longer, you know, now former president of Y Combinator. And you can find calculators on the Internet that, you know, will help you determine equity in this way. Um, but he's sort of saying these are some bullet points for when you would not have an equal split. So if you're bringing the ideas to the company, if you're bringing like a core expertise, like a medical background and someone else and your co-founder is just like an ordinary salesperson, um, if you're bringing some of the key relationships to the business, um, if you're bringing like a lot more contributed capital um, and if you're, you know, sweating and some, to some extent more than the other, you know, these are all instances where, um, you know, you might consider, you know, a, an unequal equ equity split. But I think the other thing that I think that's important for people to understand is that, so say like you're a technical co-founder and you're going to be trying to recruit, let's say MBAs to, to come and be your co-founder. You really have to appreciate that for all the time that you were spending building, uh, you know, this code base that you're hoping to turn into a company, they as well were uh, doing, you know, the same at MBA school, gaining their own valuable experience. And, you know, one of the, you know, the truths of modern economics is that even though we have uh, economic specialization and you want someone that has specialized in their experience enough to where, let's say, they're deep in the bowels of the engineering department, they're deep in the bowels of the, the product or the, the sales department, you know, when you come together in a startup, now you're going to need to be kind of doing each other's roles a bit more and you're going to need to have an appreciation that you simply weren't educated on in these specialized corporate roles um, about the value that each of you are bringing. And so, you know, I think when you're maybe more starting out and you're kind of closer to that age of having graduated university, this is a bit easier to do. And as you get further into your careers, that can this can be a bit harder to do. Um, but I think uh, one of the things that's important is if, in a, and if you're the MBA, you need to also value that the technical person has been, you know, spending just as much time as you building that cache of, of tech skill set. So that's important when it comes to, to valuing your, your people on an equal basis. Um, so if we switch gears for a little bit or now let's go into a deeper, possibly more interesting topic we can start to talk about vesting and um, 
you know, I think my the structure that I prefer uh, tends to deviate a little bit uh, from traditional advice, or I just like to think of it like it gets more into the nitty gritty. And I think it's a, for me, it's an effective strategy uh, that I have found works pretty much across the board. So, um, you know, without uh, further ado, I suppose, um, and there's some other notes that I've kind of captured that are worth going into, um, but we can circle back to those. So my story of uh, when I devised you know, how I would forever uh, onward discuss formation and equity splits and, and corporate structure uh, kind of is as follows. So I'm a, I'm a technical background. Uh, you know, I've spent years and years uh, developing a cache of technology tools um, that in theory, you know, allow me or enable me to be a CTO for any kind of modern cloud uh, or SaaS business, um, or you know, any kind of product offshoot that would rely on on cloud and SaaS. So that's like the majority of you know modern internet you know businesses or anything that needs that kind of you know internet-based system, which is most businesses. So that's what I bring to the table, and. Um, you know, I had a story where, you know, I had posted on AngelList. I had found uh, two very competent uh, guys that uh, both happened to oddly have this military background. Uh, one had gone to West Point, and then the other was in the Air Force. Um, I believe the West Point guy was officer, and then the Air Force guy was, you know, a senior enlisted, um, but now had been retired and was working for a defense contractor as a program manager, I believe. And then the other was working in roofing or construction sales. Um, so, the, so here we had a team of, I was the tech guy. Uh, we had the, you know, the sales guy that believed he could go out and sell anything. He just needed to educate on technology. And then we had the operations guy who oversaw, uh, you know, program managers. Um, so he wasn't on the product side, but he would help implement or oversee, you know, a team, teams, multiple teams uh, in order to implement things. So we had the guy that loved the spreadsheets. We had the guy that loved to go out there and get on the phone. And we had the guy with me that loved to build stuff. And yet when it came time to formation, there was a big struggle um, because I, you know, was the one that kind of brought us together. I was the one that was proposing the idea. And I realized, um, you know, that as I was, uh, you know, bringing us all together, that I was also a bit inflexible in terms of, you know, they wanted to go down this route of chasing government contracts and .NET. And I don't think that they were very educated to know that, hey guys, I write JavaScript code. <laughs> I don't just pivot what I do into being like your code monkey and writing .NET. And I could feel in our conversations where almost there was this, this tension or this pull where you know there was a desire to almost pull the, the resources that we collectively had into a direction that like, ultimately influenced the amount of control that, that one person or the other had. And so here is a situation where you arguably had, you know, three very alpha dudes that all wanted to to power, you know, in their own direction as much as possible. You just had different approaches. I was kind of like the stubborn, aloof one who kind of would play the game, you know, of like detaching myself completely if that's what I needed to do to get control. You had the, the operations guy who loved spreadsheets and was willing to go into the numbers to, you know, to vouch that he deserved the most equity and control because he was the most capable of managing it. And then you had the sales guy who was convinced that he was the most capable because he could go out and you know actually get the deals that resulted in the revenue and cash is king in business. So this, of course, forced me to really strongly consider you know a structure uh, that I was I was willing to accept. And I think the, the core assumptions that I learned um, that I encourage everybody to come up with for their own you know, dealings, uh, both in, in life and in business generally, uh, and I think specifically to technology people, I think where I landed could apply to a lot of people. But I wound up finding myself telling these guys, look, I'm like a roofer. I will build any kind of roof you want. I will do it under any kind of constraint that you want. And that's my professional delivery. 
Um, but what I discovered over time was the saying that I will build anything you want, but you cannot take my tools, meaning that I was okay even to give these guys, let's say if they wanted to give me a 20% share of the company and you know each take 40 for themselves, that would have been fine. Uh, but I, instead of like giving up all of my life's work and tools that I used, that was going to instead uh, be worked in as a licensing deal. Now, just like with the Paul Graham, you know, that we started out this video talking about, you know, many investors simply will hate stuff like that because they view that as co-founders quibbling uh, and, you know, making things more complicated, ultimately making the business less attractive to investors. And at the point that you're earning a billion dollars, which, you know, the, the co-founder or sorry, the founder's perspective is like how many of the Y Combinator businesses actually hit a billion dollar valuation, maybe like one in 500, one in a thousand. So to bet your life's work on a one in 500 or one in a thousand chance, you know, no one's really willing to do this. Or on the other side, you know, most of the technology founders that do make this bet then wind up, let's say, breaching their own contract, you know, hoping not to get caught by like taking their tools and then repurposing it for like the next startup or their next pet project if it if it fails. So I don't personally like those approaches. I like trying to be honest, straightforward, and reliable in business. And I, I think that you know your two options become like, are you willing to breach contract and hide away, you know, that you're gonna use your tools here or there and just not tell anybody? And I do think in the news, we at least are starting to see an uptick in prosecutions of investor fraud. Not that this would be investor fraud. Um, but generally speaking, if you're a technology person, I, I advise thinking of yourself like you're a roofer um, and that you're willing to build whatever, but, you know, guard your tools. Um, but I think that if we talk about, you know, the MBA perspective, you know, what I learned from working with these guys was that I don't want to stand in the way of someone who's driven, who's smart, who's capable. And I want guys like that to be able to take a 60 or 80 percent share if that's what they want to do. Um, but at the same time, I, because I'm driven to, to build startups, you know, I'm just as willing to take the 60 or 80% and give them 20, you know, they might not be depending on the type of role. Maybe that's not a fit. Maybe you do want in a sales role, someone that is that driven, but maybe if you're talking about operations and, you know, book management, maybe, you know, lesser, you give them more of a, uh, income and you give them a lesser set of equity. So that's that topic in terms of like where I landed in terms of, uh, you know, how do you protect your tools? And I think my answer is through things like licensing deals. Now you can have your licensing deal vest over time, which I think leads us into our final topic of vesting. Um, and there's this idea that you could have a clause that says something like, you know, upon reaching a, you know, pre-money valuation in the business, and you'll have to go read that venture deals book that I had referenced. Um, but upon reaching, you know, a uh, a pre-money valuation of let's say 10 to 30 million, at that point the um, the business can have the option to purchase the license, uh, you know, into like an ownership or something thereabouts. Let's say for five hundred thousand dollars or something. Give yourself like a nice bonus. Uh, for allowing the tools to vest to the company, give the investors that option. But what I like to try to do with the licensing is additionally offer exclusivity so that the tools can't compete in any other um, type of segment that's similar. And I think another model that, you know, is handy or helpful to consider that it just at least exists out there is the joint venture model. Um, and so I'm not saying that with this type of licensing deal that the joint venture is exact. But a joint venture basically says, for instance, that you could take all of your assets and tools, um, let's say even if you're, uh, you know, some kind of a, uh, you know, a non-technical person, but let's say you have a lot of no-code based, you know, automations that you've written up in like Notion or ClickUp or into Airtable, and you want to just bolt them onto the business, but you know this is something you've worked on for two or three years, you know, a joint venture can give you some of the inspiration of terms, you know, over which you would say, you know, during the, the course of the company, you know, it's going to be your, 
you know, your core focus um, of time uh, is going to be with the joint venture that you're pursuing with others. And that at the end of the duration of the joint venture, you know, there's the option to vest all of those contributions into, you know, a different and to be negotiated set of terms that, you know, expand beyond just exclusivity. Um, but this is something that, you know, generally the, the legalese of a joint venture is generally considered complicated enough um, and would be different. I think sometimes the joint venture can take on its own corporate entity. Sometimes it's uh, not, you know. So there's a difference between, in other words, a um, a joint venture, and these. It's a fascinating subject. Difference between a joint venture and something as simple as a licensing deal, um, you know, with added stipulations that your your efforts are going to be going um, to the company specifically. And I think another thing to consider um, would be if we just go down the rabbit hole a little more of corporate structure would be a cooperative style business where, you know, you can figure out ways and, and you'll see this. I think this here is lim uh, listing all kinds of different. Um, this is a good one to maybe look up. So if you look up UW Center for Cooperatives Business Structure Comparison, there's a really good um, uh, infographic here that, that compares and contrasts uh you know different types of corporate structure and i think you could look at like a cooperative and you could really see anytime you're having conversations with co-founders like you you'll you'll feel when people kind of go in a different direction of saying like well i'm not sure if it's the right time for me like i have a family to provide for and i really maybe need to bring in some income before i i dedicate myself and what I kind of advise people to do is, you know, you have to kind of consider that, you know, when you're talking to co-founders, you know, it's got to be the right timing, the right skill set and the right, you know, willingness. Um, and it, to, to find these things is so rare to find someone that's willing at that given moment with the right skills to invest time into your, your company, it's a pretty rare event. Um, most of the time, you know, people are either going to need to be, you know, you'll find people that all the time are really just in the job market needing to make money. It's much rarer to find someone who has money taken care of and is willing to work for you because most of the times the people that have the competence and the skills are often already employed and too busy. So you're typically finding someone, you know, your ideal is someone who's kind of burning out but has a good nest egg and a six-month runway to really take a risk, which is why often the advice for where you find co-founders from is not online, not any kind of like co-founder dating site or anything like that. It's previous co-founders, friends of friends, um, and people you went to university with or like a, a graduate level program with. Um, but in terms of, uh, you know, these different types of structures, it's useful to think about in different ways that you can work with people. Um, you don't always have to be, you know, the equal equity share. I've already documented, you know, ways that I think, especially if you're a technical person, you tend to want the CEO to be have the lion's share of shares. So you can come up with clever ways like licensing to back yourself a little bit out of you know having to take as large an equity chunk um, but you can also assure your contributions back to the entity with things that if you borrow from language from something like a joint venture you know that you're not gonna whereas like you can take the inspiration of you know the the joint venture and funnel it back to your product like the product ultimately for the sense of the joint venture it's going to have exclusivity so you will not build in that market for any other purpose you will focus mostly on the joint venture during the time at which you're you're accruing shares and contributions and all that, um, and you know you can also look at different models as well, um, maybe like whether it's a cooperative or uh, or similar uh, in terms of just gaining inspiration for different structures. But your goal shouldn't be to tie yourself to a corporate structure or legalese. Your goal should be again, if we go to the very beginning of this video. You want to offer the most flexibility possible while maintaining your best genuine efforts and contributions to the startup. So you want the structure stuff to get out of the way. And in that sense, I do agree with Paul Graham. But when you come to like things like for me, it was like I'm a roofer. I'll build anything. Just you can't take my tools like you can't chop off my hands. Uh, I won't I just won't be willing to risk a one in 500 chance for the you know what never being able to work again. It's just a non negotiable. But if you give me enough assurance that I'm going to walk away with $10 million, then sure, I'll sell you my tools. 
um, because at that point, you know, I, I have enough time, you know, in terms of finance to rebuild those tools if I so please. Not that I would want to, but it's something I could consider. And I think that everyone should have that kind of conversation with themselves and arrive at that. Here we are. It's a very long video, but the last thing I want to talk about is vesting. And I want to talk about, if we go back to the book that I had mentioned again, let's pull it up on screen, Venture Deals. Venture deals will give you all kinds of different ideas about the structures, corporate structures of doing a startup. And, uh, you know, if we go into that book and we talk about vesting, um, you know, one of the things that you're doing in any kind of contract language is you're coming up with uh, contingencies, edge cases. What happens if, you know, this unexpected event happens? Uh, what's the game plan? And that's that's effectively what a contract is. So uh one of the things that's most important is vesting you're not necessarily even if you have you know your two mbas you're the technology person and you know they're going to each take uh 40 percent you're going to take 20 percent you don't necessarily get those shares immediately there is a sense that like if you have um you know some code that you've written and you're contributing that at the outset or you have something that's a hard asset that you're contributing you know, I did, you know, we have our now our new corner of, of the Internet of ChatGPT and today's ChatGPT, uh, you know, ask ChatGPT section. So my accountant notified me that, you know, you can take hard contributions. Like, let's say you have a bunch of Airtable, no code automation assets. You know, you can contribute this stuff under a Section 1244 um claim which allows you to deduct it from the tax liability of the business i think up to it says fifty thousand dollars and that of course can influence things um like your your you know your your vesting you might be able to vest the equivalent of that fifty thousand dollars immediately but for the rest of the time what i kind of would advise people on and it's just you know let's say an opinion and it's where i landed after my experience with these two mbas is I want most people to every quarter you're going to have a board meeting and you're going to do the equivalent of um, it's a practice used by companies like Google and other companies you're going to set OKRs and so if we look up what an OKR is it is a, an objective key result and it's this idea that as an executive you're let's find one with a better graphic as an executive you're going to be you're not managing employees you i really just want an image you are all going to come to the business um with your own drives you're not managing each other and you uh you don't have the skills to manage each other either you're you're bringing unique skill sets so what you want at the beginning of each quarter in board meeting, I think, is you want each executive to bring what their objectives are for the next quarter. And then what they're going to do is they're going to measure, um, because you have as part of these OKRs is, and there's plenty of information out there about how to learn about setting OKRs. And companies like Google use this as a, as a metric for like granting bonuses and stock units and promotions. Um, so it's very similar to what you have already in the corporate world for, you know, quarterly and annual check-ins. Um, but the idea is that you're coming up with measurable uh, results based on what you've done. And you're going to sort of, as the executive, you're going to come yourself to the board meeting and you're going to sort of say, okay, here's my objectives for the next quarter. Um, this is what I'm going to bring to the business in terms of KPIs, or, you know, I'm going to have a way of measuring what I do. So maybe I'm going to increase traffic. I'm going to get signups. I'm going to go build a database of 500, uh, you know, cold lead contacts that we can then warm in a CRM. I'm going to, you know, go present to 50 investors. Those are all measurable things. And I think what we want out of the OKR is then you're going to say, and then for this, I'm going to vest, uh, you know, 3% or I'm going to uh, vest, let's say the, the company starts out with 10 million units of shares. And let's say, you know, your MBA is going for 40% of that. And let's pull up a calculator and figure out what that number is. I really swear the Windows thing is, let's do 10 million. Here, we'll get us back onto this. 10 million shares divided by multiplied by 40 4 million shares let's say over a three-year vest of like what 
that is that that's like 36 months right so that's 111 thousand per month times three months let's say it's like three hundred thousand fine round number great so they're gonna say that okay I'm gonna uh, vest my you know three hundred thousand uh, shares uh, as a result of getting you know 50 investor meetings and gonna have a, a database uh, and a CRM that I set up of 500 you know sales leads that we can warm over you know the following quarters so now you have not only a you have an executive uh, your co-founder that has justified their shares in terms of kpis um and so now you can hold them accountable so if they don't and i i sort of advocate having both a baseline like i'm just gonna be there also for meetings and this is this is what i'm gonna get just for existing as a co-founder and then you're gonna have performance-based goals where if i achieve these uh, metrics then I'm also going to get, get a, bo a bonus in terms of stock units so I believe in having a mix of those kind of incentives and so then now you have a way of holding the executive holding yourself accountable uh, to the team and you're also as a as a founder in these board meetings you're going to vote on it you're going to determine whether or not you think that their goals are driven and, uh, and competitive enough to, to, to deserve uh, these the shares that they're trying to chase you're gonna allow it to be fluid so you're gonna allow them to say like whatever amount of shares that they want but they're gonna have to justify it in terms of if they can't justify it in direct revenue and money they're gonna be building a uh, system of KPIs and the KPIs ultimately at the start you you're gonna in business you're always gonna start with a model of KPIs like okay we're gonna start out with signups we're gonna start out with cold lead calls but over time, you're going to build this model of having a system of KPIs to revenue. So the double uh, you know, value of, of, of proceeding in this kind of way, I think it not only brings sanity into what your board meetings do, it brings sanity into how you're doing equity splits. It's, it's bringing sanity into accountability of the business and what you're actually doing over the quarter while preserving the independence of the executive. Um, but you're also alleviating the ambiguity when it comes time to raise money or justify the value of the business to anybody by having a system of KPIs. Um, because at the end of each quarter, in order to receive the, the shares in terms of vesting, you're going to have to then restate your case about what you, how you performed over the last quarter to reach the KPIs. So you're literally going to track the KPIs. And that's going to do the work of when it comes time to go raise investment. Now, all of that data goes straight into the investment sheet and you've saved yourself a lot of headache and a lot of time. So that's vesting. And I think that that's about where I tend to cut off the advice. This is a very long video today, um, but it's, it's a great subject and it's, it's a subject that I have spent a lot of time on and you know gotten myself into numerous situations where I've had to think about this and you know I know that from the system that I've kind of devised you know I'm I feel as though you know I'm I'm quite successful at it because you know what you really want out of your system and I encourage you to come up with your own system and feel free to borrow from these ideas if you like is you'll see it work you'll see it when you talk to people that you again you mostly just want the flexibility of I'll work with you in whatever capacity you want um, so that we can obtain profitability together and the legal structures are important I think to educate yourself on but don't ever be bound by them and don't ever get yourself into a situation where an investor or a lawyer has an upper hand on you as well so let's cap it there we'll do another video and hopefully by next video my nose is doing better um, and carry on and i hope you have a good time finding co-founders for yourself till next time like and subscribe